But with that, without further ado, well, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the rain, for providing with us new fresh water. Thank you for this day. Thank you for alarm clocks, even if they were late. Thank you for this team of people who blesses one another. And please, we give you free reign over this time. Touch our hearts and our minds and bring us to the place you would want us to be throughout this morning as we come together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, for many of you who have heard me be blessed to be up here, you've heard me talk a lot about grace. And I can't get away from the subject. So I'm going to do a quick recap of things we've talked about and take you through uh, this journey that I've been going through in recent weeks. First of all, I've shared before that I believe that the grace that Jesus Christ provides to us is definitely for salvation. But it doesn't stop there. It's, it provides grace every day. I call it the everyday grace in our life. And this kind of grace teaches us how to live, and it guides us down the path of righteousness. And I'm going to jump through some scriptures pretty quickly. Feel free to turn there if you want. But the first scripture that talks about how grace influences us, our lives every day apart from the law is in Titus chapter 2. And I'm going to be reading from verses 11 and 12, which says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So grace helps us to live the life of righteousness, righteousness that Christ has given us. It also, grace not only gives us salvation and teaches us how to walk in the righteousness that we've been given, but it causes us to grow in our relationship with Christ. And 2 Peter 1, 2 says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And I've shared before that this grace motivates us to want to serve and be good stewards for Christ. It doesn't drive us, it leads us. And when that happens, it permeates every part of our life. Again in 1 Peter, this time in chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various terms. And I will tell you, I've been living in this new knowledge of the grace, everyday grace that God has provided me through Jesus Christ, I've been, it's permeated my mind. I talk about it all the time. I put a veil over things all the time. But I will tell you that that's kind of where it's been staying for me, in my head. It's been staying in my thoughts. And I've been sucking the idea of grace for my own benefit very well. But it hasn't permeated my life to the extent that I would like it to. And as I pondered this idea that I have this knowledge, and sometimes I would use this knowledge to shame people who rely on the law, I started reading the Gospels. And in Matthew 5, Jesus talks about the salt. Now, we've known for thousands of years that salt has healing property, but I think you and I would both agree, when, we think, when I think of salt, I think, I need salt for things because it makes it yummy. Food is yummy with salt. If I had to choose between popcorn with a lot of salt and a chocolate cake, I would pick the popcorn with the salt. Chips with salt. salt. The salty savor is what I go for. And if you offered me popcorn without salt because you know too much salt is bad, I'd say no thank you because the salt is what makes it, what makes it. Jesus puts it this way about salt that doesn't work. And this is found in Matthew 5, verse 15. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
Now, I'm just going to interject something here. I don't think Jesus is saying that if we don't do certain things, he's going to throw us out. Because it very clearly says in John 6, 37, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. But I do believe that Jesus is saying that as Christians, we've been given this salt. And we, if we have no flavoring in our walk, we're not much use to the world. That's what I think Jesus is saying. And uh, when you think about it, I know in my case, when I eat that popcorn with a ton of salt, or that ham sandwich, or whatever has a lot of sodium, when you eat it, you get real thirsty. And when I thought about that, I realized people who are the salt of the earth through Jesus Christ because they understand the grace that we've been given, there's this abundance around them. There's this joy, even when their life really is falling down around them. And when you're around those kind of people, it makes you thirsty. Even as a Christian, if I'm around someone who has had horrible things happen to them and they're joyful and excited and telling you uplifting things, it makes me thirsty. I want to be like that person. And I think as Christian, that's what God tells us we should be like. That's what I think he's talking about when he's talking about the salt the savor that we add to the world through his grace. And I would even say because of this knowledge that I've been carrying around in my head, well, God doesn't want us to be those sad and praise Jesus, but you know, that doesn't make you thirsty. It's like, I don't want to be around that person, downer, donner, or whatever. But as I'm going through this process of thinking about, gosh, Jenny, you have all this knowledge in your head, and yet you like it for yourself, but what, are you salty? And I realized, wow, I'm kind of like the people don't, I mean, on a superficial level, I think people think I'm fun, but in a lot of ways, people that I don't like, there's a few in my life, or when situations are concerning to me, I don't think I add that savor, uh, savor, the saltiness. And then I, as I thought about Jesus, as he talked about salt in Matthew, I was thinking, would he say to me, if you aren't making a sinner thirsty once in a while, what good are you, Gina? And I thought, wow, that sucks. Because that's where I think I'm kind of been lately. And then so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to keep look, reading the gospel because I, I want to reflect about what I'm doing. I don't want to be just a sayer of the word. I don't want to just know the word. And the Lord brought me to Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to be reading um, the second part of verse 11 through 15. And that reads, The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for the stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. I think we would all agree, we have all received the greatest gift in the world in Jesus Christ. His grace alone is something we can't hold on to ourselves. It's huge. We want to minister that grace to everyone around us because it's a bomb. It's salvation for eternity. There's so much. 
everyday grace is so important in addition to salvation. So let me recap where we've been so far, because I've jumped around on some key issues. Grace is real and powerful for us every day, not just at the point of salvation. It doesn't stop there. As followers of Christ, we have assurance that his grace will last forever. The only thing that would stop it is if we refute, no, I don't follow Jesus. That's the only thing. We are called by Jesus to be the salt to others. And being that salt, I want to cause those around me to thirst after the truth of the grace of Jesus Christ. Because this knowledge of the grace of Jesus Christ is a huge gift. And the Word of God also says, as a seed, I'm sorry, the Word of God is a seed, and just because we believe it doesn't mean we are persevering to produce a great crop. And here's the deal. For months and months, I've gotten these truths as I've shared in my head. And I felt good in my heart about it. I rejoiced by this truth. I've shared it with you. You've heard me speak of this here. I've talked to many of you one-on-one -on -one about my excitement for the grace of God. In some respect, it has changed me dramatically. I try not to do certain things. I try to conform to the truth of the grace in my life. And yet reading these over the last few weeks, maybe a couple months, a thought hit me. I let the, the worries of the world choke me. I'm not maturing in the knowledge that I have. I'm not making people thirsty around me. And this began a self-reflection process of me. And it was painful and very overwhelming. And I got very good day after day finding that wasn't, you didn't rely on grace right there. Wow, you perpetrated the law on that person. You judged them. Wow, Gina, you know this and you keep screwing up. More and more I did that. And through it all, I, I had this prevailing thought in my mind is, I don't want to be good for nothing. I don't want to be thrown out and not cause people thirst. I want to be the salt that God created and provided a means to be. And then, as I'm going through this process of focusing on my failures, of acknowledging over and over again that I'm failing in every aspect of my life, a thought came into my mind saying, Gina, do you think that might be the devil that's condemning you? Because the word says Jesus doesn't condemn, the devil condemns. And this is my reaction to that thought. You screwed up again, Gina. You're listening to the devil now. Now you're listening to the devil and believing him? You're really messed up, Gina. I'm just saying that. <laughs> exactly. The circular, circular I was spiraling. And then, Despite all the knowledge and all the gifts I've been given through Jesus Christ, my Savior, I started thinking that's, this is how God sees me too. Every day he looks down and says, wow, Gina, you're listening to the devil? Wow, Gina, you're doing this? And you can see how each moment of this thinking brought me further and further into the depths of despair, guilt, self-hatred. But then a revelation hit me, and I was shocked. You might say, duh, Gina, hello. You may say that, but I'm, gonna sh I'm just being real here. It came in the form of a text from Stephanie, Dina's sister. About a week ago, it says, good morning, sis and Gina. Interview went good yesterday, and the lady sent my resume to the company, so I will hear back either today or tomorrow. Plus, 
plus we have a guy coming over tonight to check out the room for rent for six month lease. God is amazing. And I was happy. I, we texted back, both Dean and I got that, and we're like, awesome, that's great, that's cool. Then a couple days later, we got another text from Stephanie, and it said, good morning, sis and Gina, praise report. Michael went to a repair shop in Saxe, and instead of a quote for $389 to fix my TV, it is $159. God is good, and he provides. Now, really, okay. In the scheme of things in life, is a repair on a TV life-changing? I don't think so, but hello, sometimes 200 bucks can be a mountain to people. Whether or not this is the case, Stephanie said, God is good and he provides. She was blessed in this. But the piece you're not knowing, you may remember in the first text, she talked about an interview. She talked about a guy coming to see a house. He hadn't agreed to the lease yet. He, she was giving credit to God for those blessings. But what you don't know is she did not get the job. She was pretty sure she would get it. When, didn't, did you see that she was all like, I didn't get the job. God must not love me, or I must have messed up. And, exactly. She was salt because she was focused on the blessings that God was putting in her life, giving credit where credit was due. She wasn't even focusing on the other crap that I'm sure exists in her life. I can tell you it exists in her life, but she was, she was sending texts about the good things God was doing in her life and acknowledging it. So when I, Saw those two texts, I'm like, well, you know, at first I was like, I'm so glad things are going well for her. That TV has been an issue for her for a long time and all these other things. By the way, the guy did rent the room, so that is a huge blessing financially for uh, Stephanie and Michael. But then I thought, all right, Gina, I know you're a screw up, but I'm, why don't you Google all the scripture about praise and thanksgiving in the Bible? And I will tell you, if you do that, there's a massive list of scripture about thanksgiving and praise. But I'm just going to share two with you real quick. The first of being 1 Chronicles 16, 8, which says, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Stephanie did that in those texts. Not that Dina and I are the nations, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Psalm 30, 11 and 12 says, you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Now, my first reaction was, I know God's been blessing me, and I haven't even noticed it because I was so busy seeing my own failures and beating myself up. And my first reaction was to beat myself up on that. And I had to stop myself and said, no, I'm going to praise the Lord because he is blessing me. And in doing so, I realized how far I had gotten from God, not because he wanted it that way, but I had allowed it because my focus, which was so easy to change, was on my failure and not on my righteousness provided by Jesus Christ. And I remembered, God called to my memory as I read Matthew. We all know the story where John baptized Jesus and then in chapter, Matthew chapter four, Jesus is tempted by the devil. And every time the devil spoke to Jesus, he would start with, if you are the son of God, then blah, blah, blah. If you are the son of God, blah, blah, blah. And I realized I had been living in that place of temptation where Satan would say to me, if you call yourself a Christian, then blah, 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 blah. If you really believe in grace, then blah, 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 blah. But I was engaging him in that. I had forgotten in Matthew 3, when Jesus was baptized, 
He came up out of the water and God said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. I have forgotten that I am crucified with Christ and that Satan can say all that stuff to me. If you think you're a child of God, Gina, then blah, blah, blah. I could say, I know I'm a child of God, so nothing you can say can change my righteousness in him. I had forgotten that. And instead, I was like, you're right, I'm not a child of God. I screwed up and I did this, and how can I call myself? So I'm going to do something very different from this point on that I've ever done up here before. I'm just going to share significant blessings in my life. And I would encourage you, in a few moments when I'm done sharing, I encourage you to share with the rest of us blessings that God has done for you. Because when we remember and praise God through Jesus Christ, what he's done, we can't help but be the salt of the earth. We can't help but to be that seed on the soil that produces what God wants in us. So I'm going to jump real quick back to 1984. I've never publicly shared this one because really um, I think it's kind of proof that I'm crazy or have mental issues. But I'm going to take a chance because I believe it's a blessing from Jesus Christ. 1984, I was 17 years old. Oh, crud, now everybody knows how old I am. <laughs> the 80s were awesome. I'll just say that again. I would love to be in the 80s again. 80s hair. Oh. Anyways, 84, I was 17. I was a new Christian. I had been a Christian for about a year. I was on fire, excited. I was in a charismatic church. We were really rolling, having a lot of revivals. I was excited about everything except one thing. Our church preached all the time that Christ was going to come any moment. He's going to be here, could be here tomorrow. Jesus is coming on a cloud. It could be tomorrow. All the signs are there. And inside, I was like, I don't want you to come, Jesus. I, I want to graduate from high school. I want to get married. I want to have kids. I, I want you to come, but really, I don't want you to come. And that started the cycle of guilt because I, I love him. I should want him to come. I should want to be with him, right? But So this struggle was happening. And one night I, I was in bed and the room was dark and I was sobbing because I felt such guilt and angst because I, I knew in my heart I didn't want him to come. And I was hearing it all the time. I was just sobbing going, Lord, I'm so sorry. I feel so inadequate. I feel so <sighs> duplicitous. I say I love you and yet I want nothing to do with your coming. And as I'm praying, I looked up and I saw a little dot of light on the ceiling and I didn't think about it and I'm sobbing and praying and, and the light got bigger and bigger. And then I rub my eyes, I'm like, wow, this crying is making me crazy. Long story short, soon the whole room was lit up and there was a presence there that was overwhelming. And before I knew it, I had stopped crying and I said, look, this is it, it's really happening. He's coming back. I'm so, and I began to praise the Lord and a joy overcame me and it, I was a different person. And suddenly the room went black as if nothing happened. And I looked around, the kind of black where you can't see your hands because it was so bright before. And I thought, I'm going crazy. And a small voice inside of me, it was like in the middle of me, said, you're ready when I'm ready. And my tears at that moment were very different because my God hears the cry of my heart. That's how much he loves us. He hears the cry of our heart. So another similar story I've never really sh shown shared publicly. This is still in the 80s. I was driving in a notoriously dangerous freeway in Orange County, um, California. There's several lanes that no matter what time of day, it's very congested and a carpool lane. And in this particular section, often people who were in the fast lane stuck in traffic would jump into the carpool lane thinking, well, I'll just come in. That becomes a problem when the people in the car lane going 50 plus miles an hour have to deal with that all of a sudden carpool out. As the case was, 
my friend and I were driving in the carpool lane. And a car pulled out in front of me. I was in a Chevy Caprice Classic, 1977. It's the cop car, big, fast, eight cylinder. I had an oh crud moment, slammed on my brakes, not good enough, bam, hit the back of him. <sighs> crud. But the car, it, went, it kept going. It wasn't a, a crash, my car is totaled, but it was a, you didn't, it was a jolt. We were jolted. The car went, kept going. I'm like, what is this guy doing? I started chasing him, honking my horn, flashing my lights, he's going. And finally, I had to get to where I was going. So I said, if, fine, if he doesn't want to stop, fine, whatever. But when I got off the freeway, I pulled off and I said, I better check because my dad's going to kill me. I better check the car. My friend and I went to the front, we looked. Not a scratch, not a dent. And we look at each other going, I know you hit the car. And I'm like, I know I hit the car. And my friend said, well, I think your guardian angel's really thin today. And I will say that by a miracle of God, I hit something, but it wasn't that car, and my car wasn't damaged, because my God is my protector. Another one in 1994, my dad, who was a tough Harley rider back in those days, not so much nowadays, he wasn't feeling well, and he was at work, and he's one of those tough guys that never admits anything's wrong with him. But his coworkers were saying, you don't quite look well. You, you don't look, and he goes, you know, I'm not feeling well, actually. And his boss said, I, I think maybe we should call the paramedics, and my dad said, oh, okay. That's miracle number one. <laughs> so the paramedics came and said, we don't, you know, really, we're, we don't know what's wrong with you. We don't see anything serious. We would like to take you to the hospital. And of course, my dad, that's where I get from. He's all like, I'm not paying for you to take me to the hospital if there's nothing wrong with me. That wasn't a miracle. That's just the way my dad is. So they left. But my dad continued to not quite feel right to the point where he went to his boss and said, you know, I'm really not feeling well. I would, do you think you could take me to the hospital? That's miracle number two. They went into the hospital. My dad walked up to say, you know, I, I just need to be checked out. I'm not feeling well. And the nurse said, you need to come back here right now. That's miracle number three, especially in Southern California. You can come with your arm chopped off, and it would be three hours. They get him in the hospital. They lay him down. They start putting the EKG, those sticky things, to check it out. The moment the doctor walked into the room, Prior to that, it was just the nurses. My dad went into full cardiac arrest. So it was so urgent that when they got the defibrillators, they didn't have time to put the gel on it. They just took it and put it on my dad. He had burn marks. Full on cardiac arrest. Will you tell me, was that perfect timing? That he was there right then? Even though before that, there were so many hindrances to be, him being there. He survived and he's still alive today. But everybody has said, if you weren't there, you would not have made it. My God has perfect timing because he loves me and blesses me abundantly. More recently in 2008, through uh, circumstances best described as uh, fear and homophobic craziness, I was outed at the Christian organization that I had worked at for six years. I had decided that I would no longer hide my lifestyle, but I was determined not to engage any discussion at work about my love life. It didn't apply to my job. And it was a very scary situation for me because I could lose a very lucrative job. And as I, the process went through, I watched people I worked with who had known that I was a lesbian get fired, even people who had been there 18 years. And I thought, what am I going to do? I can't lose this job. I'm going to lose money. I have kids. I have family. We have a house. And then a sense of, you're going to be OK, came over me. It was a miracle feeling, because I don't ever feel OK if I'm going to lose my job. I'll just tell you, that's not my flesh. And I did lose my job, but I got a year's pay that got me through that situation. I was okay. 
my God is a provider. I have thousands upon thousands of blessings that I could share with you today. Dina and I adopted two children. We had planned to adopt one and we didn't have enough money. I can't tell you how we afforded two. I can't, we can't, we've tried to figure it out. Dina was unemployed for 18 months and she had come to the very end of all her extensions and we in this church were wondering how, how are we going to do this? She had applied for hundreds of jobs. She even got Texas certification to teach and applied for teaching jobs for nothing. And yet through networking with Todd, she was interviewed for a job with the city of Dallas and received it almost to the day her unemployment ended. You can't tell me God doesn't bless me. You can't tell me God doesn't bless you. And these stories are the salt because when we share it, it makes you thirsty. But more importantly, when you share it, it makes you realize, you know, God is blessing me too. And it takes you back to that moment when God says, I love you and I'm well pleased with you because you've been crucified with Christ. My house present day is a miracle. Dina and I have more friends two years in Texas than we ever had in California, in large part to this church. You can't tell me I'm not blessed. And so at this point, I would like to open up to anybody who would like to share about a blessing that God has given to you. Tim, I, I meant to say this earlier, but you know, blessings can be kind of silly, it seems, sort of like the TV that I shared with uh, Stephanie. On the website for Crossroads, Tim, Pastor Tim has a story about needing a hose. And you were thinking, I really need a hose? You know, some people would be like, well, okay, but God provided a hose for you. That's a blessing. And it was miraculous because he knew the desire and the physical need. Blessings come in small and big packages. So by all means, if anybody would like to share, small, Kathy? Yes. And so that was like, you know, it was God. It was God. Like it was salt everywhere. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for those who shared. And I encourage you, especially if you are like me and you start beating yourself up, stop it. Think of who you are in Christ and think about the blessings. Even if there's just one you can think of, think of it because I know there's at least one. So let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus. Thank you for providing us a means to be your salt. Thank you for placing the seed on good soil. Remind us of your abundant blessings and let us share those blessings with others in word and deed and love. And thank you for loving us unendingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.